started. Oh, okay, so welcome again. Uh, my name is Rachel Schaefer. I use she, her pronouns. I am the uh, policy and advocacy manager for Cascade Bike Club. And I would like to welcome you to the Washington Bike Walk Roll Summit. Um, we're excited to have you with us for this five-day virtual event, and we're thrilled to have so many folks from communities around the state and beyond. We'd like to start the session with a land acknowledgement. This summit is virtual, and those participating are joining us from many lands. We acknowledge the land Cascade Bicycle Club sits on today as the traditional home of the Duwamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and Suquamish tribal nations. If you don't know whose lands you're on, take a look at the chat in a minute, and uh, there'll be a link there where you can click on and find a map of um, you can use, use to look up your place um, on the land. Uh, without them, we would not have access to this environment. So we take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. And we'd also like to note that we are recording this session and it will be available following the summit. This summit is hosted by Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes, two sister statewide organizations with a shared vision of bicycling for all. Cascade serves bike riders of all ages and abilities throughout Washington State, educating new riders, advocating for safe places to ride, and holding events and rides. Washington Bikes advocates for bicyclists' rights, endorses political candidates, holds officials accountable, and works to shape policies that will make bicycling safe and accessible for all. And we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors whose collective contributions have enabled us to bring together 15 panels with expert speakers with registration free for all attendees. So thank you to our sponsors, Amazon and the Washington State Department of Transportation. And now for a quick introduction. Again, this panel is about transportation master plans around the state, building bike, walk, and transit friendly cities. Our panelists are Michelle Swanson from Olympia, Chris Como from Bellingham, Colin Quinhurst from Spokane, and Inga Note, also of Spokane. Uh, today we're going to join representatives from small to mid-sized cities around the state to discuss how we can define the future of transportation through city-level transportation master plans. We'll hear about lessons learned, common tactics, and recommendations on how to build up equity into these plans and programs. So after this introduction, we're going to hear from our panelists for about 40 minutes, and then we'll wrap up with hopefully about 10 minutes um, for time for questions from the audience. Um, so throughout the presentation, attendees are encouraged to ask questions via the chat bar, and we have chat monitors who will direct these questions back to myself to ask the panelists at the end. Um, we'll also provide a feedback form at the end in the chat feature as well, so that you can give feedback on the summit itself. Um, additionally, all registrants who are informed of a set of community norms in your welcome email. If you feel that these agreements aren't being met or you're feeling uncomfortable, please direct, direct message the folks with an asterisk in front of their name in the uh, chat feature so that they can assist. We are working to create brave spaces for conversations and will maintain a standard of respect as well as a space for growth. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and hand it off to um, our, Michelle, I believe is starting, <laughs> uh, and she can take it from there. Thanks everyone. While I uh, take a moment to find my unmute button, it moved around on me. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming to the session. I hope that you find what I have to share is valuable in your own communities. So my name is Michelle Swanson. I am an associate planner with the City of Olympia in Public Works Transportation, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Olympia's first ever transportation master plan, which our city council adopted about six months ago, the so last February. We have just got word that we've won two awards for this plan, but they haven't been publicly announced. So I can't tell you which awards yet. You're just gonna have to take my word for it. This plan marks the culmination of three years worth of work for us. We are just two planners plus one very skilled admin assistant. And we also have the support of Farron Peers on this project. I do wanna pause and note that our plan specifically defines pedestrians, cyclists, people walking, people biking, as including disabled people, some of whom use adaptive devices to get around. So when you hear me use those terms, that is what I mean. So I thought I'd orient you a little bit to Olympia. You might've heard that we are the home of the state capital. 
We are on the west side of the state, about 30 miles south of Tacoma, and we have about 55,000 people living here. We also have uh, about 60,000 jobs, so we are a net importer of employment. About 12,000 of those people used to work on the Capitol campus, and right now about 80 to 90% of them are teleworking. That has had some very interesting effects on our transportation system, but that's a totally separate presentation. In Olympia, we do not have any speed limits over 35 miles an hour. And we also are part of a region that has had a policy for more than 20 years of not widening streets beyond five lanes mid-block. Now, every city has its funding challenges. One of ours is that our largest employer, which is the state, of course, does not pay property taxes. And that is one of our largest sources of revenue. Now, what pushed us to make a master plan was actually an earlier process in 2016, during which we scoped what it would take for us to have a multimodal concurrency program. So this slide shows what that program ultimately shaped up to be, but in order to create this, we needed an entire master plan first, and multimodal concurrency is actually contained within it. So I'm gonna break this down just a smidge. Multimodal means multiple ways of getting around, so walking, biking, taking the bus, and driving. And concurrency refers to a requirement of the state's Growth Management Act, which in a nutshell requires that new infrastructure be in place at the same time as the new development that's going to need it. Like probably most cities in Washington state, our concurrency program was initially created in the early 90s, right after the Growth Management Act was passed. And our program only required that we add capacity to our streets for motor vehicles. So this is one of the transformative changes that our master plan ushers in, and in fact, was the impetus for it. So previous generations have done a lot of work and invested a great deal to build a street system for cars, which this photo uh, shows. Early on in this master planning process, we focused a lot of attention on defining a network for walking and biking. And that's what I'm gonna focus on here since this is the Walk Bike Roll Conference. I do want to mention that for the motor vehicle network, our goal is to continue maintaining it and connecting up the street grid. A well-connected street grid is also crucial for transit as well as for people walking and biking. And we also worked closely with inner city transit as we develop this plan as well. So some of the challenges that we face and that many other cities in Washington face are that much of our street system was built during the post-war period. An example of which is shown here in the left two thirds of the slide. You can see that there isn't a dense network of connected streets in, these, in this area. Those that are connected tend to be longer routes, particularly contrasted to the tight grid that you see on the right of the screen. That's a section of the city that was developed before 1940. So this means it's harder to walk and bike in this area here on the left two thirds of the screen because the distances that you need to go are longer. The traffic gets concentrated on those through few streets, which makes them less safe and inviting for walking and biking. And compounding this, many of those large streets were originally built without sidewalks and certainly not with bike lanes. This type of street grid is also difficult for transit to use due to the long turnarounds as well. So we do face a considerable challenge in retrofitting the street system, particularly in uh, parts of the city like this, which is a big part of our city. Given the sheer volume of work that we needed to do to retrofit our streets, we wanted to define pedestrian and bike networks that were reasonable as networks, but not so unrealistic that they would fall in the realm of fantasy to build. So for the pedestrian network, we mostly focused on making our major streets more permeable to pedestrians. What I mean by that is big, busy, fast streets are barriers to people walking. They're hard to cross and they're very hard to walk on when they don't have sidewalks. So for our sidewalk program, our goal is to build one on one side of major streets with the expectation that later we can go back and build one on the other side. For crosswalks, I wanna make it clear that we're talking about more than a pavement marking, which is why we're calling them enhanced crosswalks. On these major streets, we're probably going to need to add things like refuge islands, flashing beacons, bulb outs. These are details that get sorted out during the design process. Curb ramps are required to be upgraded to the current ADA standard with many projects, whether our own or those built with private development. We do keep track of them and we are planning to report them annually as required by our ADA transition plan, which was also recently passed. 
And accessible signals are added when we upgrade or add traffic signals and sometimes by request. Now there is a piece of infrastructure that we call pathways that forms part of our pedestrian network. It also forms part of our bike network. So I'm gonna tell you about those in just a second after I tell you a little bit about this bike network. So planning this bike network was like a planning process within a planning process. The last time that we planned for bikes in this city, we were only looking at putting bike lanes on busy streets. This time we planned a network of what we're calling low stress bike facilities. This includes separated bike lanes, bike boulevards, paved trails. And we wanted to appeal to the broader number of people who might be interested in riding bikes, but don't feel comfortable in standard bike lanes on busy streets. So we decided to create the low stress bike network on roughly half mile intervals so that no one will ever be more than a quarter mile from one of these routes. And one key piece of this network does include those pathways. So pathways are short trails for people walking or biking that connect up our street system particularly in a part of our city that doesn't have a well-connected street grid. These are crucial connections that let people get where they're going without having to take long circuitous routes on streets that might not have sidewalks or bike lanes yet. So you can see in the map here, two pathways that connect up from cul-de-sacs. These are often used by children walking to a nearby school or biking. And they're also used by adult cyclists who wanna get off a major street to ride on some neighborhood streets. Now we've maintained an inventory of pathways in our GIS for several years. Uh, GIS, if you're unfamiliar with the term, is Geographic Information System. It's a way of storing data that has a geographic element, and we typically show those data on a map. Some of the pathways in our inventory are formal, they're paved, and they're open to public access. Some other pathways in our inventory are dirt paths on private property. So we took this inventory and we prioritized for improvement, all of the pathways that are not paved. And for the pathways that are on private property, when we do um, have the opportunity to pave them, we're gonna negotiate with the private property owners to ensure that there is public access for these pathways. We believe these are important connections for that people are already using and we really need to formalize them. So I wanted to give you an example of one of the ways that we use GIS to prioritize the project. This slide actually shows the second part of the process that we went through with enhanced crosswalks. So the first part isn't on the slide, um, but that was where we um, found out where we needed to put these um, enhanced crosswalks by telling the computer to identify sections of major streets that were within 300 feet of common pedestrian destinations. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about those destinations in a moment. So this shows how we scored them after identifying them. Using GIS allowed us, also allowed us to ensure that we didn't miss things. It allowed us to build models that we're gonna be able to rerun when we need to update the plan in about uh, six years. And it also made it easier for us to do public outreach online because we used a tool called Story Maps. Story Maps are a standalone website that allows you to embed maps, text, photos, videos, and surveys. And we reached many more people using them than we have in the past using more traditional outreach methods. This was a major investment in time and resources, building these inventories and also doing these analyses. Among the many long-term dividends that we expect from this, we'll be being able to report out to the public on our progress in achieving the goals of this transportation master plan. So another key part of this plan was the funding analysis that we did. We estimated how much of each type of facility we've built in previous years and how many we could build in the next 20 years, assuming that funding and our pace remained about the same. So for example, we found that we built four linear miles of sidewalks in the previous 10 years. So we're estimating that we can build eight miles in 20 years. Obviously this is a rough analysis, but when you pair it with the defined networks for each way of getting around, we are for the first time able to offer a clear picture of what we need and if we have the funds to get there. And this has already teed up a broader community-wide conversation about transportation funding because the results of the analysis show that our funding falls far short of what the public would like to see us build. Now we were in kind of uncharted waters when it came to weaving equity into this plan. Most of the examples I've seen of plans that have done this are from larger cities and they've been able to rely on demographic data from the American Community Survey and that's conducted by the Census Bureau. These larger cities have been able to map where more historically marginalized people live in their cities. They've been able to map the projects that they wanna build and then do an analysis from there. 
but we're not able to do that because the margins of error from the American Community Survey data are just too big at smaller geographies, which means that the data is too noisy to be meaningful. I'm gonna drill down on this a little bit and explain what I mean. So this is an example of a census block group in downtown Olympia. This is from the 2017 five-year estimates of the American Community Survey. It says that there's an estimated 103 black or African-American people living in this census block group. However, the margin of error is plus or minus 96. Now these data are calculated at a 90% confidence interval. So that means if you were to rerun this equation 100 times, 90 times, it would return a result between seven and 199. So that's the plus or minus 96. The remaining 10% of the time, it would actually return a result outside of that. Now for even smaller populations, you can see that the data is even less reliable. For example, for uh, American Indian and Alaska Native people, in theory, you could have negative 12 people. Well, that's not useful. We needed to use something else. After a lot of thought, we decided to prioritize investments in pedestrian and bike infrastructure near destinations that we think is gonna put a thumb on the scale to make our transportation system more equitable. We also reasoned that building a system in which people can realistically get around without having to own a car is a more equitable transportation system. So for example, we did include schools, medical facilities and grocery stores, particularly to address gender equity because we know that women do the vast majority of grocery trips and are also more likely to be the person who's driving someone to a medical appointment or to school. We prioritize pedestrian facilities like sidewalks and crosswalks near transit lines because we know that access to transit means access to vital services. We included places with high employment density to help people walk, bike, or take the bus to work so they won't need to own a car to earn a paycheck. We included residential density because many of the people who live in poverty in our city do live in dense housing. Now, this plan also marks a transition away from request-based systems. So in the past, if somebody wanted a crosswalk, they could call us up and request one. We'd evaluate what type of crosswalk was needed based on the conditions of the street, and then we would put it on a list, and it was a very long list um, to build. What happens with that kind of system is you're actually building inequity into your city, because in general, it is only the most privileged people who will call you and request a piece of infrastructure. So this plan for us really marks a transition away from a small city to a more formal mid-sized city. We may not be defined as a mid-sized city, maybe, um, by a lot of other definitions, but we think so. Before, uh, staff held information about the transportation system in kind of a loose collection of Word documents and, that was not very accessible to the public. The public expects the transparency and the predictability that our master plan provides, and it bridges the gap between the goals and policies outlined in our comprehensive plan, and it sh is going to show what gets built by showing how and what we plan to build for the next 20 years. So, Thank you very much for your time. We're, we will have time for questions later, but I hope you feel welcome to get in touch with me anytime. I love nothing more than to talk about this kind of stuff. So I'm gonna turn this over to you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. <clears throat> I'm going to try and share my screen now. And hopefully everybody can see that and uh, we're ready to go. Uh, so I'm gonna focus mostly on implementation. You heard a lot about the creation of Olympia's master plan. Uh, I am going to talk about uh, our plans and how they were created, but also what we've done to implement them over the last say 10 years or so. So with that, we're gonna jump right in. I'm gonna go really, really fast. I've got a lot of information to cover and we've got limited time. So I'm gonna talk fast and go quickly. There's time for answering these questions uh, at the end of the, the session here. For those who aren't familiar with Bellingham, we're north of Seattle, south of Vancouver, British Columbia. We're about 100,000 residents at this point and we're a college town. Uh, Bellingham is largely focused on outdoor and uh, active recreation lifestyles. Uh, we're the regional center for the Whatcom region. That means we have a lot of inflow and outflow from our, our city, kind of like the tide going in and out every single day with uh, people coming to jobs and shopping, et cetera. We try to focus on uh, multimodal transportation and, and protecting and providing safe and comfortable infrastructure for the most vulnerable users, which are 
pedestrians, bicyclists, and people trying to get to bus stops. And um, we're also focused on balancing our transportation system. We fully recognize that it still has to work for all user groups. We want facilities for everybody, but the system also has to work for everybody. We've got three major active transportation plans in Bellingham, a pedestrian master plan, which we'll go through in a minute, that was created in 2011 and 12, bicycle master plan that was created in 2013 and 14. And then for the last 30 years or so, we've, we've had a series of uh, property tax levies to create a, an 80 mile uh, multi-use trail system throughout our city. So jumping right into the creation of our master plans, as I mentioned, uh, in 2011 and 12, we began uh, working on our pedestrian master plan. This was right after we created a transportation benefit district that provided sales tax revenue uh, for infrastructure. <clears throat> and this just kind of lays out the uh, process that we went through. There was quite a lot of public engagement. Uh, we had several open houses. We had surveys. We had an interactive map. We had neighborhood meetings. Um, we, we established a steering committee for both the pedestrian and the bicycle master plan. You'll hear more about that. Uh, we made sure it was consistent with our comprehensive plans. We looked at a number of uh, concentrated areas in the city, what we call urban villages here in Bellingham. And then it was adopted uh, by our city council at, near the uh, end of the summer in 2012. The ingredients for the pedestrian master plan included, uh, as I mentioned, lots of public engagement. And this kind of just indicates how uh, we got that, the instruments that we used, as well as what kind of uh, feedback we got. And this was the geographic representation uh, from the different neighborhoods in Bellingham. We've got 25 individual designated neighborhoods in Bellingham, very involved and very engaged. We used a pedestrian suitability analysis to look at what, what we call the main factors, uh, live, work, and play, and then uh, also quality issues. And here's the network that we came up with, uh, 258 miles um, throughout the city of Bellingham. Does not include all of the streets in Bellingham. There are in fact streets that have sidewalks that are not part of the designated pedestrian network. Um, that's what this is showing on the right side, is just what's designated as the pedestrian network. Unfortunately, uh, our network also did not include the urban growth area at that time. That's, that's something we, we learned later on um, we should have done. We'll talk more about that. Um, there's a huge number of projects um, to be uh, dealt with, and it created a tremendous uh, cost. You heard Michelle talk about there's always more need than money to fund, and you can see these numbers here are very large numbers, over $300 million in current uh, dollars to implement that. Our bicycle master plan, similar process, 2013 and 2014, uh, again, we had uh, lots of public engagement, we had open houses, we had surveys, we had interactive maps, we had neighborhood meetings. Um, we made sure that it was consistent with uh, both our pedestrian and transit plans, as well as our comprehensive plan. Again, we focused on our urban village areas, our demand areas. Um, and again, it was adopted by our city council uh, in October of 2014. In terms of the ingredients that went into uh, developing a bicycle network, um, we looked at, at surveys. We, I mentioned the interactive map and neighborhood meetings. And on the right, you see these, these demand locations. There's 30 of them throughout the city of Bellingham, downtown being the largest. You can think about these kind of like magnets. This is what attracts people to these locations. So we looked at a number of different types of bicycle facilities, as you can see here on the left. It's not just bike lanes. There's all sorts of different types of bicycle facilities. Everything from bicycle boulevards on, uh, on residential streets, low volume, low speed, uh, to a uh, cycle track in our, in our Bellingham waterfront area. Uh, we have separated bike lanes. Uh, we might show some pictures of that as we go. And down here is something called Bellingham Bikeways Illustrated, where you can see examples of all of these different types of bicycle facilities uh, that we've implemented with an explanation of, of what they are. 
On the right, you see our citywide bicycle network with a different type of facility recommendations. Now, importantly, there were about 21 uh, locations where we did not feel comfortable making a recommendation. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but um, they're called further study needed. To get to uh, what we thought was needed on the bicycle links that we made recommendations for, we used a form of level of traffic stress. We used the Mineta uh, Transportation Institute's methodology for that and customize it for Bellingham using all of these ingredients that you see on this slide, this layered approach. And we came up with recommendations on the network. We also used something that we call connectivity analysis or route directness index methodology um, to look at what would happen from a user standpoint and a land use standpoint if you were able to connect one area to another. Now this is proprietary uh, software that was developed by the Transpo Group. We purchased a license and, and Transpo Group helped us use this for our analysis in our bicycle master plan as well as the prioritization of our project list. It's called Veocity. And uh, so we use this and what you can see on this slide is, is before any kind of implementation on the upper left. And then our first bicycle boulevard connecting the Roosevelt neighborhood into the downtown core. And then on the right, a fully connected system with our bicycle master plan and how that changes the connectivity from a land use standpoint. Of course, you've got the big mobility barrier of I-5 right in the middle here. So what this is showing is that we've provided better connections for the Roosevelt neighborhood into our downtown center across the interstate um, with our bicycle network. And of course, this is showing our prioritization methodology. These are the factors we used to weight the criteria that we used. Then we used our connectivity and stress level analysis and came up with prioritization scores. On the right side is, is how things shook out in terms of number of projects and the scores into four tiers for prioritization. And then now I'm gonna show you how we've been successful in uh, implementing these. One thing that we do is we report each year uh, on the progress that we've been able to make. Our report is called the Transportation Report on Annual Mobility or the TRAM. We've been publishing this since 2006. Uh, it's available on our webpage and it shows by uh, concurrency service area. You heard Michelle talk about multimodal concurrency. We've had our multimodal concurrency system in place since 2009 and these graphics are from that report. Here's our pedestrian uh, network on the left and the number of projects that we've created or implemented on the right, uh, about, well, 79 or 80 projects total, if you include this year's. This includes uh, sidewalks and crossing projects. And then on the bicycle side of things, we've actually been incredibly successful implementing more than half of our project list, 111 total bicycle improvements, out of 215, over 52% of our bike plan has been implemented uh, since it was adopted, so just the last six years. And in recognition of that, this last year, uh, December of last year, gosh, I guess it's been, <laughs> we're coming up on a year, uh, they, they promoted us from silver level bicycle friendly community to a gold level. That means that we're one, only one of two gold level bicycle friendly communities in Washington state and one of only 34 gold BFCs in the entire United States. We're pretty proud of that. Over the last 10 years, uh, this is how uh, our networks have shaped up. And again, a lot of this uh, is thanks to the fact that Bellingham voters approved sales tax revenue to help us go build all of this stuff. And I will say that in 2020, uh, in, in 2010, they approved uh, the sales tax levy by 58%, but in 2000. 20, uh, they, they re-approved it by 83%. So they clearly uh, see the value in what we're doing here. We've been extremely successful in making sure that the infrastructure is going into our, our lower income neighborhoods. And that's because when we prioritized the project list, uh, we specifically weighted it so that it would favor low income areas where bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure is, is desperately needed. Here's uh, just some more graphics showing, um, this is our primarily our bicycle uh, network connectivity in different parts of town. I'm gonna 
scroll through these real quickly, but you can see that over the years, um, we've tackled different sections of town and been able to implement quite a lot. Uh, you can see that it connects into our multi-use trail system throughout different parts of town. And we've done some studies on certain corridors where we don't have the money yet uh, to go address these areas, but we have plans once we do get there. We've also learned some very important lessons over the last 10 years in trying to implement these plans. And on the pedestrian side of things, um, one important thing to consider is that we've got a very, very long project list and a huge portion of that project list, over one third of it, are in excess of $1 million in terms of what the sidewalk project might cost. We don't have that kind of money. Um, it's, it's something that we're gonna have to figure out as we go forward. And I should tell everybody and any consultants listening, on Thursday, we're gonna be publishing an RFQ to update our pedestrian and bicycle master plans over the next year and a half. Um, so look for that. Um, and, and we're gonna get real serious. We wish we could do more with public engagement in person, but we'll do the best we can through uh, what we hope is the tail end of the pandemic. And there's lots of things to tackle. Um, you know, we need to look at, as you heard Michelle mention, um, at least looking at sidewalk on one side of the street and maybe changing the waiting criteria for where we have streets with sidewalk on one side versus both sides. Ideally, we'd love to have sidewalks on both sides, but from a practical standpoint, we don't have that kind of funding and we need to really try and prioritize uh, streets that do not have um, facilities over some that do. On the bicycle side of things, um, like I mentioned earlier, we've been far more successful in implementing that plan, um, but we can make some great enhancements to our existing bicycle master plan. As I mentioned, we do have separated bicycle facilities. We don't have many of what some people might refer to as protected bicycle facilities, and we certainly hear a desire for that in our community. That's one thing that we'll be looking at. Um, we, we also have some challenges though with physical space, uh, that's available, um, as well as costs to uh, do some of that type of infrastructure. But um, again, these are things we're gonna be tackling in the next year and a half and hope to come out with some even better plans. If you're interested in seeing uh, more of what we've done over the years, here's just a, a, a list of resources you can go and look at. You can also uh, email me. This is my contact information. I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of the session or uh, throw me an email and, and ask your question that way. And I will pass it off to Colin. All right, sorry, I was getting my screen up there. You can see that. Um, Happy to be here this afternoon and to talk about transportation plans in the city of Spokane, uh, specifically around active transportation, so bike, biking, walking, and rolling. I'm Colin Quinhurst, Assistant Planner at the city of Spokane. And I'm Inga Note, a Senior Traffic Engineer that focuses on planning with the city. And I'll kick us off and then Inga will take over halfway through here. Um, so first, a little bit about Spokane. Um, we're right over here on the east side of the state on the border of Idaho. We're about 220,000 population. Um, so uh, the second largest city in the state, right around the size of Tacoma. And uh, you know our employment is mostly focused around healthcare for the region. And in our bicycle master plan and our pedestrian master plan, um, I'm going to start with what the goals are and you know, the vision for walking and biking and rolling in Spokane. And these are two separate plans. So they're adopted separately in different years, but they're both part of our comprehensive plan. Um, so riding a bicycle is supposed to be comfortable and integral for getting around for daily life in Spokane for people of all ages and abilities and barrier free mobility for all populations. So those are the overarching goals and visions. Um, and specifically, our goal is to quadruple bicycle ridership over the plan horizon. So that's over the next uh, 20 years since when it was adopted to triple the mode share and to complete the 220 mile plan bicycle network and providing a connected, equitable and complete walking network. So um, what are we seeing as we put this on the ground? 
Um, so those are the goals. What are we seeing so far? Um, so jumping straight to where we're at right now, um, as we increase miles, we're increasing ridership. So in some of the neighborhood pathways last year that connect neighborhoods into nearby destinations, downtown, regional pathways, we saw about a 60% increase in ridership. And that mirrors um, the increasing number of, of miles of infrastructure. Um, so how are we doing in implementing the plan? Um, we are about 45% complete overall. In terms of bike lanes, we're about halfway. In terms of neighborhood greenways, which are bicycle boulevards or our version of bicycle boulevards, we're only about 9% complete. And then in shared use pathways, we're over halfway complete to achieving that network. And the total network, as I said, is about 220 miles. So we're at about 100 miles, 100 miles in. Um, and what we're finding as we start piloting some, some new types of infrastructure that aren't specifically called out in our plan currently, um, we're seeing um, pilot projects demonstrating a preference for separation and protection. So uh, we did one pilot project in 2019. And the question for people who use this facility was how safe do you normally feel uh, riding a bike in Spokane? And about 60% felt neutral, unsafe, or very unsafe normally, about a third felt, felt safe. And with the protective facility, that number flipped. 60% felt very safe in the protected facility. So it went from 60% neutral or unsafe to 60% very safe. So that's a key piece of data that's um, guiding us in, in what we look at going forward. Um, but how do we get there? So how do we translate that from you know, increasing miles and increasing ridership? Um, well, the railroads have played a big role in that, um, and the railroads have played a big history in Spokane overall. Um, Spokane as a city wouldn't really be here without the railroads. In the 1900s, early 1900s, right around the turn of the century, there were four railroads that converged in Spokane as a crossroads. In the lower left corner, you can see how that network kind of collides in Spokane in 1924. Um, and so there's this, this kind of spider web of rail lines throughout the city and built on top of that is a network of streetcar lines. Um, in 1912, there were 25 separate streetcar lines throughout the city, over 150 different vehicles, and 24 million passenger rides per year. So it was a, it was a rail town. And mirroring that growth in the railroads, the population grew in that time from 30,000 in 1900 to over 100,000 in 1910 in just 10 years. Um, and at that time, the population downtown was about 30,000. So it was, it was the boom town. Um, right now, for, as comparison, there's about 3,000 people living downtown. Um, so people were literally like living under sidewalks and crawling out of manhole covers during the winter. Um, but you can see how that, so the reason we're mentioning that is that that history, that legacy of rail lines has provided the, the backbone of our bike network. And that's what we're building off of. Um, so these are all shared use pathways that are built on former rail lines. You can see the downtown insert in the lower left corner there, that, that network right in the middle of downtown is built on a former rail yard that was uh, handed over from BNSF to the city of Spokane in the early 70s for the 1974 World's Fair. Um, and that transitioned into pathways and then connections uh, throughout the city along former rail lines. So there's a series of trails and the dotted lines, you can see our proposed trail connections that will link that together. And so the rest of our network in our bike plan and pedestrian plan is really building off that core for active transportation for walking, biking, and rolling. Um, our pedestrian master plan was adopted in 2015. And similar to what Chris and Michelle showed as far as having a series of criteria that were overlaid and weighted. Um, you can see that in these maps. Um, there was a pedestrian demand score that looked at a series of criteria, including employment density, population density, and location of popular walking and biking destinations, and also demographic factors. So where the different uh, populations and what the characteristics of those populations are. Um, and so the community really played a role in identifying those, those key destinations. And those are overlaid to kind of to create these pedestrian priority zones that you can see in these kind of purple clouds or coffee stains 
depending on your perspective, um, on the map. And now we have an online map that can, you can see the sidewalk gaps um, and the ratings for each segment. And separately, in 2017, our bicycle master plan was updated. And it's been kind of an incremental series of updates with two major updates in 2009 and 2017. Um, and it's building off a core of recommendations from the 1970s and 1980s from a countywide and regional council bike plan that identified a few priority routes. Um, and this is, this is when it translated into a city specific plan. And the phase we're at now is incrementally updating this plan. So as land use and development change, uh, we've been doing updates the past two years, about a dozen updates each year, and they're mostly upgrades. So upgrading, you know, formerly just kind of signed shared routes, upgrading those to neighborhood greenways and planned neighborhood greenways. And a lot of those recommendations are coming through our neighborhood councils. So our neighborhood councils have an annual traffic calming program where they can identify problems and projects. And many of those um, projects that they're identifying are bicycle boulevards or neighborhood greenways. As we see those come forward, we're vetting those and integrating those in, into the master plan. Um, similarly, um, we are figuring out how to integrate the separated and protected facilities, the low stress, all ages and abilities facilities that both Chris and Michelle talked about. And the first step in that um, was a text amendment in the plan last year that said any route classified as a bike lane currently as a future bike lane can be considered for a protected bike lane design, uh, depending on you know, further evaluation. And it also identifies the need for identifying a future network of protected bike lanes. And our bicycle advisory board identified that as their top priority project for this year. And so as the bike plan undergoes the next full update, uh, along with the comprehensive plan in the next two or three years, that's, that's a key factor that we'll be looking at. Um, and so you can see the direction we're headed as far as what we're prioritizing, what's, what's really coming up, um, building on that backbone of shared use pathways is neighborhood greenways and protected bike lanes. Um, no one's really interested in, in sharrows on busy streets anymore. Um, I think we've all experienced that and uh, it doesn't really move the needle. Um, and then, you know, the kind of the minimum striped bike lane on an arterial is something that we're, we're just not seeing a big change in ridership from those types of investments. So I'll pass it off here to Inga. Okay. So um, going forward, we're really focusing on um, those four things at the, the bottom of the screen, which is how to improve our crossings of arterial streets building a good neighborhood greenway network, building physically separated bike lanes instead of just a stripe on the roadway, and then continuing to build out and improve our shared use path network. So in, uh, in 2019, we went through a major update of our street design standards. It took several years and um, we just got it adopted in late 2019. So, in that process, we tried to find some ways to uh, update our standards where they were better incorporating our goals for bicycle and pedestrian improvements. So one of the main things that we did is we standardized a 10 foot travel lane in the city before um, this update that really wasn't an option. It was something that you know, we had to get a design variance for it to do. We've incorporated several council policies that they passed on their own um, regarding crosswalks, leading pedestrian intervals, pedestrian recall, and APS. And so tried to provide some guidance for our design engineers on how to incorporate those into the projects. We rewrote our clear zone policy, which was for many, many years, it was 10 feet, no matter what street you were on, if you were downtown or if you were on a 45 mile per hour street, it was 10 feet. And so we've updated that. It's significantly smaller now on lower speed roadways. And um, we also added a little bit of, of language in there that allows us to substitute a shared use path in lieu of a sidewalk. Um, it wouldn't seem like this would be an issue, but we actually had a project last year where that became a major issue for some neighbors who didn't want a shared use pathway in front of their house. And they used um, tried to use that section of our code to fight it. And so we made it clear in there that we can make that substitution where we think it's justified. 
Some of the other changes in the design standards were making our minimum bike lane width six feet instead of five. We specified for our design staff where to use green paint, which you know had been um, something that was kind of evolving as a practice and nothing we had really written down. Um, we have a section in there that talks about how to select the appropriate bicycle facility, whether it be buffered um, or if it has some kind of physical separation based on the volume and speed of the adjacent roadway. And we provided some guidance on how to design bike lanes near BRT stations. And we have right now a, um, a brand new BRT line called the City Line that is running, going to run through our downtown and our university district and connect our community college on the east side of town. That's gonna to start in um, spring of 2022. And going through the design process for that was, was challenging because we had never done it before. So now it's something that we've tried to put into our codes for the future. So one of the strengths that Spokane really has is um, a good range of local funding sources. We have a, a traffic calming program, which is funded through red light cameras that are installed at several locations throughout the city. And we can use that program to fund things like um, sidewalk infill, shared use pathways, crosswalk improvements, traffic circles, and a number of other things that are requested by the neighborhoods. Along with that, we have a school safety program and using a similar funding source, this one comes out of school speed zone cameras. We dedicate those funds to improving school walk routes. And so we do sidewalk infill there, we do improved crosswalks for the schools, and also in some locations, we do shared use pathways. We have a transportation benefit district, which was established in 2011. And this was the $20 car tab fee that our city council was allowed to establish without having to take it out to a vote. A certain percentage of that goes into a specific fund just for sidewalks. And so we use that to help do infill projects. And then our transportation impact fees, which was first started in 2011 and has kept going as a, a good program. We um, charge the fees on all new development. And more recently, we've retooled the program a little bit to not focus entirely on capacity improvements, but also to allow multimodal and transit type improvements to be considered as, as part of those capacity improvements. We now allow a credit for developers who might build covered and lockable bike parking on a site. Um, we also allow a credit if they would build, say, a shared use pathway through their project that connects to a nearby school or a park and they make that open to the public. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how we've been successful with grants. Um, I think one, one of the key things that we do is we you know, make sure that we have them adopted into the local plans. And you know, this, this session has really focused on you know, your transportation plan, um, which would you know, usually be folded into your comprehensive plan. You, um, some agencies have their own separate bicycle master plan and pedestrian master plan, which we do as well. But we, we do take it a step farther. We have 30 individual neighborhood councils in Spokane. And most of those have gone through a neighborhood planning process where they all have their own standalone neighborhood plans. And so we usually try to fold some of the improvements that we want into those plans, which also helps to strengthen our applications and might get them into a recognized planning document sooner than we can go out and do our, you know, our regular update of our comprehensive plan. Another um, tip that, that we have is just to put your most competitive projects forward when you have the opportunity to apply for funding. Most cities have some kind of a ranked priority list, but a lot of the time the project at the top of your list is not necessarily gonna be the best scoring one for whatever the program is. And so we go through an exercise whenever we have the opportunity to kind of do our own individual, how do we think this is gonna score exercise and really put in the ones that we think are, are gonna get funded. We try hard to develop partnerships with the schools and with transit agencies when we're doing these. With transit especially, we would try to work with STA. Um, if we're putting in an application for a pedestrian hybrid beacon, it's usually gonna be on a transit route to start with. Um, and then if there's a bus stop nearby, we will include in the grant that we're going to improve that bus stop by widening the landing pad so that it's the right size for the bus 
and maybe even including a shelter pad so STA can come back and install a shelter in the future. And just a, another tip for the people who are writing grants is just to, to watch for the evolving priorities as they change. Um, specifically at the federal level, you'll see new things every time we you know, get a new transportation funding bill or have a new administration come into office. Um, the big ones that seem to be coming out right now are, are more of a focus on equity and climate change. And so we'll be trying to tailor our grant applications and the, the projects that we pick to, um, to really meet those evolving criteria. So just to, to summarize, the, the near-term bike network goals for Spokane are first to, to focus on our shared use pathways and complete those gaps in the trail network that Colin showed you. Um, there are several more. That map was showing the ones that were specifically on the rail lines. So we do have lots of places where it fills in in between those. Um, but we have some pretty critical gaps that we, we want to get filled in. And then we also have the opportunity, which is kind of unique, where there is a brand new freeway being built in Spokane and not many places are building new freeways anymore. So um, we, as part of that project, there's going to be a shared use path that parallels the freeway. The Northern part of it is already done. It's called the, the Children of the Sun Trail. And so we're working on the Southern part with WashDOT on how that ties in south of the Spokane River and then how it connects into I-90. So there are several opportunities there for us to also build out a shared use pathway network that parallels I-90 and also improves the bridges that go over I-90 where the neighborhood was divided when that freeway was first built. We're trying to focus more on improving arterial crossings. I think we, we've done a, you know, a fairly good job of trying to build out bike lanes where we have it on the network, but a lot of times the um, past projects have not focused very much on how to actually get people across the arterials or through the intersection in a safe manner. And so trying to emphasize that more. And then um, a project that we have coming up in 2022, this is going to kind of parallel the, the city line project where we're going to have our first BRT through downtown. We are also restriping and rebuilding part of Riverside Avenue, which is shown on the screen here. And we will be building our very first protected bike lane where the bike lane is going to be behind the sidewalk, or sorry, behind the parked cars and um, between the cars and the sidewalk. So we're excited about that and um, hope it's a, a big success and the citizens really enjoy it. So with that, I think we're on to the, the Q&A section. All right. Thank you everybody for their wonderful presentations. We've been getting a lot of questions and comments in the chat and we have about six minutes left. So I think I'm gonna to try to do a little rapid fire round here and call on just one person per question if I can. Um, and we'll see how many we can get through. So starting way back at the beginning, uh, this first question is from Rochelle. Um, the uh, uh, participants wondering to what degree socioeconomic indicators could substitute for racial demographics in pursuing equity in small populations where racial stats have excessive margins of error? Yeah, that's a great question. I saw it in the chat and I wasn't 100% sure how to address it, to be honest with you, because uh, the socioeconomic factors um, that I am aware of also come from the American Community Survey and they also have the same um, problems. Now, I did see uh, in Chris's presentation that um, they, I, if I, I, I don't want to characterize what you, what, what you did, Chris, because I'm not 100% sure, but it looked like you might have used um, maybe like HUD subsidized housing. Um, locations and that's uh, readily available from um, HUD. So uh, we can pull that and then also social services providers as destinations. Um, I love that idea. Um, we, I did pull those data and um, I did compare them against the criteria that we had um, already just to make sure that we weren't missing anything and um, it, it all aligned. So I'm pretty comfortable saying that to the best of our abilities that we are advancing equity significantly with this plan. Um, but yeah, data is a real challenge um, for those of us in, in small cities with small geographies. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna throw this one to Colin. This is a, a design standard question. Um, do you know of any particular state or federal design standards that recommend or require sidewalks to have a buffer rather than being located direct, like directly adjacent to arterial streets? This is a question from, I wanna say this was from Phil in Yakima. 
Um, I am not. Inga might have information on that too. Sure. And it's a very particular, it's a specific design standard question, so it might be a little, a little too specific for the purposes. But Inga, if you've got an answer, feel free to chime in. Oh, and you're on mute. Can you repeat the question? I, I was scrolling through and sorry, sure. I didn't catch all someone of was Someone was wondering if there's a, a federal or state design standard that requires sidewalks to have a buffer rather than just be located directly adjacent to arterial streets. Oh, I don't think so. We, we try to build them separate, but we ha sometimes have to build them adjacent. Okay. The next one's great. We're moving through. Um, this is a question for Christopher. Um, I think you might have answered it to specific people, but if you can answer for the whole audience, um, when was the vote for the tax for the multi-use trail system? And is it a perpetual tax um, or does it need to be renewed by vote periodically? So <clears throat> just let me make it real clear. So most of our transportation funding is sales tax revenue. Uh, the multi-use trail system that I mentioned is funded by a property tax levy that was first approved in 1990. It has been uh, reapproved by the voters three times since then, um, most recently just a couple years ago. But they're different funding sources. One is for specific rec recreational facilities, the multi use trail system. The other is for our on street pedestrian bicycle networks. Cool. Thank you. Um, next question is for Inga and Colin, or either or, first um, in Spokane. How does the need for snow removal affect implementation of protected bike lanes? I can start and then hand it off to Inga. Um, that's one reason we're currently testing just one project downtown first is because we need to get our maintenance and sweeping and snow plowing systems down on that first project. And, and that's a good location because we have equipment nearby, but that's one reason it's, it's moving a little bit slower. That, that is probably the number one question we get about protected bike lanes. We'll, we'll figure it out, but I don't know exactly how it's gonna work yet. Alrighty, <clears throat> moving right along with that two minutes. Let's see another question for Inga, which is um, you said that all vehicle traffic lanes um, were reduced to 10 feet. And so how did you justify the reduction? Um, did you need some kind of exception for that? So, so it's not all of them. It is allowing us to drop down to 10 foot. Uh, I believe our previous standard was 11 and 12 feet on certain arterials and a lot of times, you know, our engineers were not comfortable going below that if, if there wasn't an exception process where, you know, somebody had signed off on it. So we just, we're making it easier for people to do those type of designs. Gotcha. Okay, let's see. I'm going to throw this one back to Michelle, um, just for an example, although any of you could answer it. Um, are your master are your master transportation plans incorporated into your comprehensive plan or referenced in the comprehensive plan in some way? Not yet. Um, so for us, our transportation master plan is furthering the goals and the policies that are articulated in our uh, most recently adopted comprehensive plan. Um, one portion of it was updated or is actually going through an amendment process this year uh, to reflect the multimodal concurrency. So that was significant. Um, and that's working its way through um, through the works. We will be updating the transportation element of our comprehensive plan in 2023, we expect. Um, we're gonna be doing a phased update to our comp plan um, this time around. And we expect that um, the comp plan will re reflect um, the transportation master plan at that point. But they are consistent. I mean, we'd be in violation of growth management act, of course, if they weren't consistent. Um, I did also want to weigh in on the uh, lane width. I um, posted in the chat, Olympia, for at least 15 years, probably 20 years, we've actually had as a standard 10-foot lane widths um, that could be related to the fact that we don't have uh, any speed limits over 35 miles an hour here. Um, we do allow 11-foot lane widths on uh, transit and freight routes. So we've had them here for a long time, and it's, it's worked well for us. Awesome. And I would love to hear the answer to that first question from all of you, but there's one last question that I want to fit in before we're to over time. Um, and I think I'll throw it to Chris first. Um, can you speak to how the AD, any ADA transition plans um, fit in with the bike ped plans in Bellingham? Sure, so uh, our ped plan was adopted in 2012, our bike plan in 2014, our comprehensive plan in 2016, which incorporated both of those previous plans. 
We just completed our ADA transition plan, adopted it earlier this year. And uh, as we move forward with our pedestrian bicycle plan updates, those will fully fold in the ADA transition plan into the new versions of those. And all of it will be wrapped up into the next adopted comprehensive plan in, in about two years. So many plans. Uh, how, is that the same for Spokane? Does that work any differently, Inga? So uh, we do have an ADA transition plan, and um, I'd, I'd say that the way that we address it is we try to focus on installing ramps in locations where we don't have any now. There, there's always a debate as to whether you should spend your money upgrading the ones that are substandard or if you should go out and, and build them where you don't have them at all or if you should be building brand new sidewalk. And so we're trying to address all of those. It's, it's a challenge, but um, I think we try to focus on installing them where we don't have them. Awesome, okay. Well, that was a lot of questions thrown at you very quickly, so thank you for answering them um, in such concise manners. I uh, want to let people get out of here on time, so I just want to say thank you again to all of our panelists um, for presenting today and for educating us and for everybody attending and learning. Um, there's a feedback link in the chat, I think, uh, if it hasn't showed up. Yep, there it is. Uh, so please provide feedback on the summit, and our next um, session is going to be tomorrow morning at 8.30 um on storytelling for agility and resilience and with that i think we will all say thank you again and have a great evening thank you thank you